Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Christy Borneman, the Marketing Manager at Cottage Health, and I have the privilege of welcoming you today to the Facts of Atrial Fibrillation, a virtual Meet the Doctor featuring Dr. Thomas Watson. Before we begin, we have a few housekeeping items I'd like to review. If you have any technical issues throughout this event, feel free to send a private chat to Zoom help and someone can assist you. At the conclusion of Dr. Watson's presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. So from now until then, if you'd like to ask a question, you can submit a question via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Thomas Watson. Dr. Watson earned his undergraduate degree as well as his medical degree at Tulane University School of Medicine in New Orleans. He completed his internal medicine residency and cardiology fellowship at Letterman Army Medical Center in San Francisco. He's been practicing cardiology and interventional cardiology in Santa Barbara for 34 years. In October, 2018, he began his practice at Cottage Health's San Inez Cardiology Clinic and has been a tremendous asset to the San Inez Valley ever since. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas Watson. Thank you, Christy, uh, and thank you everyone for uh, tuning in and joining us uh, this afternoon. I'm, this has been a, a difficult time and we really haven't been able to do much in the way of educational programs, uh, either for physicians or for patients. It's um, been hard over the last uh, 18 months or so to actually get together. And now this Zoom format is, uh, is something that uh, hopefully we can use going forward. I'd also like to thank uh, the support of the marketing department and the IT department uh, for all the background work to get this uh, program up and running. So what I'd like to do today is try to keep this more um, consistent with uh, kind of an office visit as opposed to a lecture. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, really don't have very many slides. I have a picture that we'll use to kind of go through things as we, as we talk about some of the anatomy of the heart and in particular of the electrical system that's very important uh, in atrial fibrillation. So that's the topic of today's talk is atrial fibrillation. And uh, the other names are AF or uh, AFib. Uh, it's a very common problem. Estimates are that between three and six million people in the United States have atrial fibrillation. And it is a disease of, uh, or a problem of uh, aging. So as we get older, the incidence of atrial fibrillation goes up. So the estimate is, as the population gets older, uh, by 2030, there may be uh, as many as 12 million people in the United States with atrial fibrillation. To look at the incidence in another way, uh, if we look at the percentage of people, the percentage of the population that has atrial fibrillation under age 65, uh, that's about 2% of the population. But as we look at the population above age 65, the number is uh, upwards to 9% of the population. So that's a huge number of people that have atrial fibrillation. And I'm sure that just about everyone either has it themselves or know somebody that has it, or if not, has at least heard about it because every night on the evening news, there are at least three or four commercials about AFib and uh, blood thinners to prevent stroke from atrial fibrillation, which we are also going to cover uh, in this, in this afternoon's talk. So what I want to cover uh, is, first of all, uh, just some anatomy and the electrical system and, and really what atrial fibrillation uh, is from a um, pathologic standpoint. Then I wanna talk about the clinical presentations and then uh, strategies for therapy. And finally, uh, anticoagulation and stroke uh, prevention in atrial fibrillation. So I'm gonna bring up a picture here that um, is uh, a stylized picture of the uh, conducting system. 
And it, the yellow is the conducting system or the electrical system of the heart. And this is a pretty amazing system. We have an intrinsic pacemaker, which is right here. That's called the sinus node or the SA node or the sinoatrial node. And it has uh, ion pumps within the membrane that bring ions across the membrane, changes the charge on the membrane surface. And as that charge changes, it generates an electrical potential. That electrical potential then uh, sets up an electrical impulse that starts down all the fibers of the electrical system of the heart. The first fibers are in the upper chambers called the atria, and that makes the atrium contract, it squeezes. Then the fibers come down here. There's a bit of a pause in this node called the atrioventricular or AV node, and then the impulse is spread down into the lower chamber and make the lower chamber contract. So what we have normally is an upper chamber synchronized with a lower chamber contraction, and that's the most efficient way for the heart to pump. In atrial fibrillation, what actually happens is uh, in the electrical system, a short circuit happens, and instead of having a contraction in the upper chamber, what we now have is uh, actual fibrillation, which just means that the myofibrils, instead of having a contraction, are basically just quivering and not generating any kind of a beat at all. When that happens, there also is very chaotic electrical activity in the upper chamber, and that chaotic electrical activity comes down and hits into the AV node, which acts as a bit of a screen, and then electrical irregular activity gets through into the lower chamber. So the pulse in atrial fibrillation is what we call irregularly irregular, meaning that the beats come at any given time. And usually, especially without medications being present, the rate is quite fast. So what we see in atrial fibrillation is a rapid, fast, and very irregular rhythm that ultimately can result in problems. So the next uh, thing to talk about then, and I'm gonna actually take the picture off here for a second. Uh, and what we wanna talk about now is uh, the clinical presentations of atrial fibrillation. And there are uh, sort of the clinical and the time presentations, and they, they are definitely intermeshed. One type of atrial fibrillation is called paroxysmal. And paroxysmal just means that it comes and goes. And by our definition, it comes and goes on its own. And it has to come and go within seven days. The next more difficult type of atrial fibrillation is what we call persistent atrial fibrillation. And this is atrial fibrillation that comes and it stays unless we do something to get rid of it, whether that be medical treatment, whether that be uh, a treatment called cardioversion, which again, we'll talk more about a little bit later in the talk, but something needs to be done to, to make it go away. And then we have one that's more prolonged persistent. And then finally, some people who go through all of the things that we can possibly do, including medical treatment and ablations, they wind up having atrial fibrillation that is permanent and we have to treat them in a way that's a little bit different than if we can maintain a normal rhythm. The um, atrial fibrillation frequently is associated with other heart disease. It may be associated with coronary artery disease. It may be associated with valvular heart disease. It may be associated with diseases of the cardiac muscle. Uh, and those diseases elevate the pressures in the heart, do some stretching of the atrial uh, walls and stretch the electrical system. And that's what makes people more prone to development of atrial fibrillation. But I would say that the overwhelming majority of atrial fibrillation actually occurs in the absence of other significant heart disease. And that's what I was describing earlier is the atrial fibrillation that occurs in the setting of the aging process that occurs in the conducting system or the electrical system of the heart. Those uh, ion pumps that I talked about, they age as well. 
They may not pump the ions across as well. And that's what sets up the electrical short circuit that can occur in atrial fibrillation. The clinical presentations uh, also vary. Sometimes atrial fibrillation can, can, can be completely asymptomatic. So about 15% of people don't even realize that they have atrial fibrillation. And this, this is fairly problematic because uh, if people are in atrial fibrillation with a rapid heart rate response for a long time, they can develop uh, heart muscle uh, problems, they can develop enlargement of the heart, and they can actually develop uh, congestive heart failure. Also, if they're in atrial fibrillation and they don't realize it, they are certainly at risk of stroke, just as if they were symptomatic from their atrial fibrillation. So the asymptomatic atrial fibrillation uh, is, a, is a real problem. And you're probably aware that we now have ways to uh, do monitoring for the general population. So Apple has come up with the, the watch that can measure a heart rate and the heart rate can give, if the heart rate goes up, there can be a warning that goes to the patients and they can actually see that they have a high heart rate. And the Apple Watch also has the ability to do an electrocardiogram strip that can then tell us uh, whether or not uh, the patient is actually having atrial fibrillation or a high heart rate from another, another etiology, uh, which actually reminds me, I wanted to go and show you what happens on the electrocardiogram as we see this uh, electrical activity course through the heart. This little bump here on the electrocardiogram is when the upper chamber contracts. So when the upper chamber contracts, we get this bump, which is called the P wave. The electrocardiogram is actually uh, electrical activity that is amplified and uh, sensed from the chest wall. And so we're actually seeing the electrical activity in the heart and this is the electrical activity of the upper chamber of the atrium. The lower chamber, the ventricle, has much more uh, mass to it, much more volume. So it actually generates a lot more electrical activity. And that's why the spike associated with the uh, electrical activity of the lower chamber contraction is much bigger and much sharper. And we call that the QRS. And then this part is when the lower chamber is relaxing and that part is called the T wave. So we use the electrocardiogram for a lot of things in cardiology, but when it comes to, when it comes to rhythms, what we're looking at is the atrial rhythm and we're looking at the ventricular rhythm. And in atrial fibrillation, this P wave goes away. And instead what we see is just a baseline that's raggedy and jagged and with no, uh, no uh, electrical activity that is apparent in the atrium. So the, the Apple Watch then can be very helpful because uh, rhythm strips can be obtained. And although the Apple Watch doesn't say this is atrial fibrillation, it says suggests atrial fibrillation, uh, but they can be reviewed. And in the doctor's office, we're able to tell whether or not the patients are having atrial fibrillation. So that's been a very helpful uh, mechanism to pick up uh, atrial fibrillation that's asymptomatic. And I've probably seen three or four patients just in the last uh, six months or so where their Apple Watch gave them a warning and it turns out that they were having episodes of atrial fibrillation, uh, which was important for us to know so that we could uh, proceed with appropriate therapy. Um, frequently people with atrial fibrillation prevent, uh, present with feeling of rapid palpitations in their chest. They're very symptomatic with it. They get fatigue and tiredness and shortness of breath. Uh, and those patients, although they uh, obviously don't feel well, uh, are maybe better off because we can make the diagnosis and we can institute treatment much more, much more, much more quickly. Uh, often people with other underlying heart disease uh, have even more difficulty with their atrial fibrillation. And when they lose the efficiency of the atrial uh, contraction. And when the heart's beating very fast and very rapidly, then they can have, uh, if they have coronary artery disease, then they can have anginal chest discomforts. If they have heart muscle problems, they can go into congestive heart failure. Uh, 
so in the setting of other underlying heart disease, atrial fibrillation can be a, a very difficult problem uh, because it precipitates other uh, symptoms and problems for the patient. So what do we do then in terms of treatment for patients that prevent that present with atrial fibrillation? And it really does, it, it depends on uh, how they present and how much atrial fibrillation they're having. There's a lot of treatments that we can do, but uh, really tailoring the treatment for the severity of the patient's problem is very, very important. So to give an example, there uh, may be a patient who develops atrial fibrillation uh, following um, an abdominal surgery. So postoperative atrial fibrillation is very common in an older population, the stresses of surgery, the stresses of anesthesia can result in the short circuit, can result in atrial fibrillation. Often as they recover from surgery, their atrial fibrillation goes away. And often uh, they may not have another episode for years or may not have an e another episode for a very long time. So for that patient, very little therapy is necessary. All that's necessary really is observation. And one of the more difficult things about atrial fibrillation uh, is its unpredictable nature. Uh, even in people who have recurrent episodes of atrial fibrillation, there often is not a trigger that, that people uh, can put their finger on. It often happens very randomly, uh, and that makes it a, a difficult problem to predict how aggressive uh, we need to be with our therapy, at least at, least at the outset. Another example might be uh, a, a patient who uh, overdoes it uh, on a holiday uh, for a party and uh, has a little bit too much alcohol. Uh, the holiday heart syndrome and atrial fibrillation can occur, uh, but then if they, if they take care of themselves and are careful, they may not, not have another episode. So that's paroxysmal atrial fibrillation in, in its easiest form. Uh, that's the one that... Uh, makes it uh, easy for us to just follow and not to proceed with any treatment. Then there's a person who presents with more persistent atrial fibrillation. And as, as they come in, they're in atrial fibrillation, they're symptomatic with it, it's persistent, it's uh, not going away on its own, and we have to do something to try to make them feel better. The first step in that setting is to initiate anticoagulation therapy, which again, we'll talk more about towards the end. But the first thing that uh, we need to do is to prevent a stroke, the most catastrophic complication that uh, we see in the setting of atrial fibrillation. So we start a blood thinner, we, we uh, get the blood thinned out and prevent any blood clots, any additional blood clots from, cor from forming, and also let the body take care of any small blood clots that, el that also may be present. Then we give medicines to slow the rate down so that people uh, are not as symptomatic with the atrial fibrillation. If their heart rate's not going too fast, then they feel a lot better. And then we gives us time to continue with the anticoagulation because one thing we do not want to do is try to convert the rhythm too early back to a normal rhythm because that definitely will increase the risk of stroke. So what we'd like to do is treat with anticoagulation and rate control for at least a month before trying to get the patient back into a normal rhythm. After a month of treatment, then we can work on trying to get people back to a normal rhythm. And notice I say try because our success rate is not, not ideal. Let's put it that way. And it's certainly nowhere near perfect. Um, if we look at uh, patients like three years or so out from an initial episode of atrial fibrillation, and we've been able to get them back into a normal rhythm, at least with <clears throat> medical therapy, our success rate's only about 50%. And we'll talk about how we improve that percentage with ablation uh, again in just a minute. So we treat with uh, drugs that are called antiarrhythmic drugs. And what antiarrhythmic drugs do is they act as chemical insulator on that electrical system. So they help to prevent short circuits from happening. Occasionally, they may actually uh, 
straighten out a short circuit and people will convert back to a normal rhythm on antiarrhythmic uh, drugs alone. But most of the time, uh, our approach to getting somebody back into a normal rhythm is to do a cardioversion. And this is a shock on the outside of the chest. It's done with uh, brief anesthesia. And it's, it's very safe and, and actually very effective because 90% of people will convert out of atrial fibrillation back into a normal rhythm once a cardioversion is done. The main problem then, as I alluded to, is trying to keep them in that rhythm. And we continue with antiarrhythmic drugs to give us the best chance of uh, keeping people in their normal rhythm, keeping them in uh, sinus rhythm and out of atrial fibrillation over a more extended period of time. The, the biggest problem that we have with antiarrhythmic drug therapy is the antiarrhythmic drugs. They are um, often difficult to use. They, they have a high uh, uh, side effect uh, rate. They can have some very significant uh, uh, and serious uh, adverse effects. They do require constant monitoring <clears throat> uh, of their uh, uh, adverse effects with uh, electrocardiogram and also with uh, echocardiogram and also with uh, uh, lab work. So they're, they're not an easy class of drugs to use. Uh, and we have to be very careful because of their adverse effects. But we do find that a lot of people tolerate them well they don't have side effects or problems from them. And it's a good therapy for long-term therapy for prevention of atrial fibrillation. Um, if we're having trouble with recurrence of atrial fibrillation uh, on antiarrhythmic drugs, then our next uh, treatment plan would be to do uh, an ablation for the atrial fibrillation. So what ablation does is a catheter is advanced from the leg veins up through the inferior vena cava. A catheter with a needle is brought across this septum here, which is called the interatrial septum. And I'm not sure that you can see on the inside of the atrium here, but on the inside of the atrium, there are the openings of four pulmonary veins. So these are the pulmonary veins on the outside. The pulmonary veins carry the blood back, the oxygenated blood back from the lungs into the heart. And it turns out that there's, they have one kind of vascular smooth muscle and the, and the heart has another kind of muscle called myocardial muscle. And the transition between those two points result in an electrically unstable area. So most of, very frequently, uh, the short circuit that occurs or the early beat that occurs, occurs in one of the pulmonary veins. So what ablation involves is placing a scar around each one of the pulmonary veins. And we call that pulmonary vein isolation. And then often another scar can be put across the top of the atrium and another scar put down across the lower part of the atrium. And then that results in the inability, if there is a short circuit, to actually course into the rest of the atrium. And that then can result in uh, prevention of atrial fibrillation. So even though the short circuit happens, it never gets to the rest of the atrium and therefore uh, atrial fibrillation doesn't occur. Depending on the patient's age and depending on the duration of atrial fibrillation, uh, depending on a, on a lot of other factors, the uh, frequency that uh, ablation is helpful uh, can be quite variable. If we take a relatively young person uh, who has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, where the likelihood of the focus coming from one of the pulmonary veins is very high, then the success rate for a fairly long-term uh, success for ablation is in the 80 to 90%. So they would be considered very good candidates to undergo ablation because in the setting where they're having recurrent episodes of very symptomatic atrial fibrillation, rather than taking years of antiarrhythmic drug therapy, it's uh, you know, much better to try to 
get this ablation accomplished, take away the atrial fibrillation and take away the risk of uh, antiarrhythmic drug therapy. On the other hand, if we take an 80 year old patient who's had long standing persistent atrial fibrillation for months, then the success rate is, is basically a toss up. It's a 50 50 proposition whether ablation is going to be successful at all to get them back into a normal rhythm, and whether if they do get back into a normal rhythm, whether they will be able to actually maintain normal rhythm at that time. And the reason for that is, is that they have multiple more multiple other areas of triggers for the short circuit that might be up in the atrium here. And even if ablation is done there, they could have uh, triggers down in the atrium here. And it's very hard to ablate some of those areas. But uh, in, with persistence, those areas can be found. And with aggressive ablation, uh, even the, in the setting where our success rate initially is low, a second ablation can be uh, very helpful to uh, help to prevent and take away um, uh, atrial fibrillation that is, that is symptomatic. Now, we talked early on about some of the asymptomatic people with atrial fibrillation. And in, if somebody's asymptomatic, <clears throat> it really doesn't make much sense to be very aggressive in going after the atrial fibrillation alone. So as long as we can prevent a stroke with anticoagulation, and as long as we can uh, keep the rate controlled with, with other medications that are much safer, uh, then it's very reasonable to allow people to just stay in atrial fibrillation and stay in atrial fibrillation as their baseline rhythm. And that's what we call permanent atrial fibrillation when they basically are in atrial fibrillation all the time and we can uh, treat them uh, and uh, not have to be concerned about trying to get them back in a normal rhythm in that setting. So that's what I was uh, saying that uh, really, if, uh, if somebody has one episode of atrial fibrillation, we don't wanna get out the big hammer and uh, you know, go after them with uh, ablation. Uh, we really wanna save ablation for the people that are much more symptomatic uh, and or, or having trouble with, uh, with antiarrhythmic drug therapy or who don't desire to take antiarrhythmic drug therapy or who are young and antiarrhythmic drug therapy uh, may not be a great idea for them to be on for an uh, extended period of time in a number of years. And finally, I'd, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, anticoagulation and stroke prevention. As I said at the outset, although atrial fibrillation can be um, very bothersome. It can cause a lot of symptoms. Uh, it can uh, make people miserable. It can make people anxious. It can do all of those things. Uh, and that's the main reason that we treat and we do our best to make them feel as well as we can. Atrial fibrillation is not a life-threatening arrhythmia. Uh, so it's not something that is going to cause mortality or probably even cause significant morbidity. But a stroke obviously will cause significant morbidity and significant mortality. And that's the most important thing to uh, make sure that uh, we avoid and prevent in patients with atrial fibrillation. So we have uh, antiarrhythmic, I mean, we have uh, anticoagulants to treat uh, and prevent strokes. Our drug that that was that we used for uh, up until probably the last seven or eight years was called warfarin or Coumadin. It was uh, a difficult drug to use. It uh, interacted with uh, it with, with uh, all vitamin K foods. It, the way it worked was the warfarin uh, uh, prevented the production of vitamin K clotting factors from the liver. So vitamin K in the diet, uh, it seemed like exercise, being ill, just everything uh, changed the coagulation. Uh, when people were on warfarin, it required uh, blood tests to make the adjustments in the doses. Uh, and it, it was a kind of a difficult drug to start and it was a difficult drug to continue. We made it a lot more convenient in the last seven or eight years as drugs have come out that are uh, uh, very specific uh, inhibitors of uh, anticoagulant or coagulation factors uh, 
and they have one dose. We have to adjust the dose in some of the drugs for age and size and kidney function. But once we pick the dose, the dose is fixed and they work just as well. Uh, and in some cases, maybe a little bit better uh, than warfarin worked in the past. So treating uh, and anticoagulating patients for atrial fibrillation has become uh, a lot easier than it was in the past. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been much easier to get people started and much easier to maintain anticoagulation uh, in patients. Not everybody with, an, with atrial fibrillation needs anticoagulation. There are some people who are at very low risk for stroke. We have a, a scoring system that's called the CHADS-VASC, that's C-H-A-D-S and VASC. So C stands for congestive heart failure, H stands for hypertension, A stands for age, uh, D stands for diabetes, S stands for previous stroke, and VAS stands for vascular disease. So we get points for, or patients get points for, and they're not good points, they're bad points. Every point that you get makes it a higher risk for a stroke. And a CHADS VAS score of, of zero to one doesn't require anticoagulation. We use aspirin, um, but a CHADS VAS score greater than two uh, the risk-benefit ratio is much higher to have a stroke than to have a complication from anticoagulation. So anybody who has a CHADS-VAS score of two or greater and has atrial fibrillation uh, of any significant burden of, at all really does require anticoagulation for stroke prevention. There are gray zones in what's the burden of atrial fibrillation that people have to have. And uh, are we always aware if, if people have atrial fibrillation uh, when we're not sure? And if we're going to err on the side of treatment versus non-treatment, we would err on the side of treatment uh, for, uh, for stroke prevention. Again, until just recently, uh, if someone was a very high risk for anticoagulation, they had a significant fall risk, they had previous bleeding, they had uh, gastrointestinal bleeding, uh, they had bleeding of source we couldn't figure out and they were anemic, uh, we were kind of stuck. All we could do was, uh, you know, say, well, your risk of stroke is high. We can't safely give you a blood thinner because of the bleeding complications that you have and we really uh, didn't have much else that we can do. So presently now though, we have a, a device that's called a Watchman device. And let me bring the picture up again here for a second. Uh, so the Watchman device is a device that again, is put in through the, through the groin vein down here, up through the inferior vena cava, and it's not shown here because it's cut away, but off of the left atrium, there's a left atrial appendage that just sits out there. And it's not really clear why it's there and what uh, it's obviously a vestigial, vestigial uh, anatomic uh, uh, part of the left atrium that must have served some purpose in the past, doesn't serve a real purpose right now, except that 90% of the blood clots that form in atrial fibrillation form up in this left atrial appendage. So what the Watchman device is, it's a, a little umbrella device that's put across the septum again, brought up into the left atrial appendage. The umbrella is deployed and it occludes the opening of the left atrial appendage. It traps all the blood clots within the left atrial appendage and then it's released there, and then the, the uh, catheter is removed. So once the Watchman device has healed, then uh, there's the risk of stroke very much approaches the risk of stroke in patients that are on anticoagulation. So it's an opportunity to prevent stroke in a patient who is at very high risk of bleeding, or very high risk of injury uh, in the setting of, of anticoagulation. Now, anticoagulation is still the gold standard. Uh, 
I, I don't think that um, we've gotten to the point where we think that placing a watchman device, and again, this is just in the last few years, so we have to gather long-term uh, uh, information. We have to know that not only does it prevent stroke for three to five years, that it prevents stroke for a number of years after that. And of course, with any of these procedures, there's always uh, some risks associated with proceeding uh, and doing a procedure. So we always have to look at the risk benefit ratio of everything that we do, but we do now have a, a, a watchman device that can be put in. Uh, left atrial occlusion uh, is a treatment for stroke prevention in the setting of atrial fibrillation. So I think that I can stop there and um, we have time for some questions and uh, be happy to, to do that, Christy. Thank you so much, Dr. Watson. Um, that was a great presentation and, and just so great having all of those visuals. It really is helpful. So right now we're going to go to a Q&A session. And if you haven't already, please submit your questions via the Q&A button down at the bottom of your toolbar. Um, so I'm going to go so far. Um, we have quite a few. So I'm going to go in order of receiving the questions. Um, so Dr. Watson, the first question is with regards to, uh, the term electrical that you were using in the beginning. Can you clarify what that term is? The question says, is it meant literally, what is that? Is it a nerve impulse? Yeah. So, uh, it's basically, um, the same, uh, physics that is in the, in electricity in our house. Uh, it's, and not that I understand electricity that much. My undergraduate degree is chemical engineering and I never understood electrical engineering. However, um, the, the ions change, there is an actual uh, uh, differential of positive and negative charge on the cell membrane. And as that charge moves down the electrical fibers, uh, it gets to the, the muscle. And when it reaches the muscle, the, that electrical charge will actually make the muscle contract. So an, an example of that would be a uh, artificial pacemaker. So an artificial pacemaker generates an electrical charge. The lead is in the heart and the electrical charge from the tip of the pacemaker is enough to start an impulse within the heart muscle, which makes the heart muscle contract. So when I say, when we, when we talk about electrical, it's, it's, electric, it, it's, it's the same physics as electricity in the house. It's not at the same level, obviously, it's at a very low level, but it is the, it is, it is the same, uh, the, uh, the same mechanism, which is probably a terrible explanation, but it's the best I can do. No, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, that makes sense. Um, we have a question. What do I do if I know I am an AFib? Yeah. So the, the, I think the most important thing to do is uh, get attention. I mean, meaning for the first time, get attention as soon as possible. Um, I talked about the the need for uh, anticoagulation for a month before dealing with, uh, with the actual rhythm. If, if you get in within the first 24 and possibly by the first 48 hours and the diagnosis is made, then anticoagulation can be started. And if we start anticoagulation in the first 24 to 48 hours, then uh, we can start treatment for the rhythm right away. We can start antiarrhythmic drug therapy. We can do a cardioversion. We don't have to wait the uh, empiric uh, 30 days uh, to proceed with cardioversion. Now, having said that, there's also a, a, another way around the 30 days. So if someone comes in, uh, they're very symptomatic. And even with rate control, they're still very symptomatic. They haven't... Uh, been anticoagulated for 30 days, we can do what's called a transesophageal echocardiogram with cardioversion. So what a transesophageal echocardiogram 
echocardiogram is it's placing the uh, echo probe in the mouth, down the esophagus, behind the heart. From that view, the left atrial appendage that I just talked about can be visualized. We can't see the left atrial appendage from the transthoracic view, but from the transesophageal view, we can see the left atrial appendage. We can see if there is clot and or thrombus in the left atrial appendage. And if it's, if it's not there, then it's safe to go ahead and do a cardioversion if it needs to be done. Again, the issue with that is uh, it's a fairly big probe down the throat. And, you know, th there really needs to be uh, uh, symptoms to warrant proceeding with that. But the most important thing is to seek medical attention as quickly as possible. Uh, and again, the most important reason for that is not because it's life threatening, uh, but because if anticoagulation can get started, we can very quickly move ahead to do other therapies besides just rate control and anticoagulation with a view toward further treatment down the road. Great. Thank you. So we have a question about exercise and AFib. How does exercise affect AFib? Well, I think, I think it's uncommon. It's pretty rare for exercise to be a trigger for atrial fibrillation, uh, fortunately. Um, you know, certainly adrenaline that occurs with, with exercise uh, and adrenaline, adrenaline does affect the rate of conduction and, and the uh, uh, impulses in the electrical system of the heart. It does affect heart rate. But most of the time, it doesn't act as a trigger to actually cause atrial fibrillation. So it's a much more difficult problem when exercise is a trigger, but it's uncommonly a trigger. So the overwhelming majority of the time is that exercise is just fine. And exercise is recommended. And in fact, exercise over the long haul with endorphins released and the relaxation effect of, of exercise may well help to prevent the unpredictable episodes of atrial fibrillation that people get. So, uh, you know, again, unless it's clear that it's a trigger, exercise is great and exercise is good for everybody. And it's, it's also good for people with atrial fib. Great. We've had a couple questions, um, people asking for you to spell out what CHADS refers to again. Chad. Yes, it's, it's just the eponym for, for C for congestive heart failure, A for A, C, H, H for hypertension, A for age, D for diabetes, S for stroke. So that's CHADS. And then if somebody has congestive heart failure, if somebody has hypertension, each one of those is a point. Age over 75 is two points. And, and diabetes is a point. Stroke is two points. VASC stands for vascular disease. That's one point. So then we add all those points up and we get the score. And the risk of stroke is not quite, but it's about one and a half to two times the CHADS VASC score. So if somebody has a CHADS VASC score of three, then their annual risk of stroke is somewhere between four to 6%, uh, which may not sound like a high risk of stroke, but that's, but that's a huge risk of stroke on a yearly basis, especially if we're looking over a number of years. Uh, so because of that, that's why we use anticoagulation. So it's, it's really the diagnoses that the people have, that patients have, and then we just assign the number to that, and then we come up with the score, and that score predicts the risk of stroke, and then based on that risk of stroke, we decide about the need for anticoagulation. Okay, great. And then how safe is it to go off the anticoagulant for short duration for things such as dental work or colonoscopy? How long is it safe to be off the anticoagulant? Yeah, so it's never perfectly safe, but obviously we often have to do it. So colonoscopy, especially if there's going to be risk of a polypectomy, because that's uh, it's very hard to... Um, put pressure on a bleeding site in the, in the colon. Um, and if somebody's gonna have surgery, they obviously have to come off because we have to have bleeding stop in and around the time of surgery. Uh, dental work you mentioned, and I would say that we should be able to do all dental work on anticoagulation. 
Uh, these days, the dentists feel very comfortable. Again, there may be more oozing, but that's not going to be life-threatening. So the safety factor is that it's not perfect, but the risk is not very high. It's a lot easier to do with our current anticoagulants because we can just stop a couple of days before. They wear off pretty quickly. We can start them when it's safe after the procedure, and they they reach an anticoagulation state very, very quickly. With warfarin, it took a long time to wear off. It took a long time to get started again. We had to do what was called, often had to do what was called bridging with other types of, with, uh, with uh, subcutaneous injections of anticoagulant. So it's a lot easier now. And the risk is, you know, kind of on a weekly basis, probably 0.1 to 0.2%. So it's very, very small. Uh, and we do it all the time. And um, it's very rare to have a complication from uh, being off anticoagulation for a short period of time. Great. We've had some questions about um, the Apple Watch that you mentioned. Are there any other at-home um, type uh, monitoring? And, and, and specifically a question about the Fitbit smart watch. Does that also serve the same purpose that an Apple Watch does? Yeah, so I'm not I'm not completely uh, versed on the Fitbit. I know the Fitbit does have a um, a monitor in it and gives a high heart rate uh, warning, but I don't think the Fitbit has an e an EKG an ECG in it. Um, so uh, in order to really document what that was all about, because uh, part of the concern is that there's there may it may be artifact, and it certainly is possible that it's just artifact and it's nothing, and it's not an arrhythmia, and it and it's just junk, and we don't want to get all excited about junk necessarily. Um, but you know, it it may be enough to warrant doing more formal monitoring. So, from a from a or from an office standpoint, we have what are called vent monitors, which are basically patches that are put on the chest wall, and they monitor the heart uh, for 30 days continuously uh, through a central monitoring center. And we can tell for sure whether people are having atrial fibrillation through that system. The other at-home system though is uh, um, uh, called Cardia, K-A-R-D-I-A. -A, uh, and it is a, an app, the app is free, but the, um, uh, two prongs to put your fingers on to send the electrocardiogram strip to the monitor cost about a hundred dollars. So that's another good way. It, it's not, it's not continuous, but it's a way if somebody's having a feeling of palpitations and they're wondering, what is this about? It does record a nice rhythm strip to be able to be reviewed and to see exactly what, what's causing the palpitations. And I'm not really sure if there's uh, another uh, EKG uh, mechanism out there or not. But, th but the cardia is one that, uh, again, a, a lot of people have and a lot of people use. And it's, it's also helpful in people with, that we've diagnosed atrial fibrillation. One of the things that I alluded to earlier was that, you know, does, does everybody that we've ever diagnosed with atrial fibrillation have to be on a blood thinner? Because clearly, if they're not in atrial fibrillation, their risk of stroke is not any greater than somebody that's not in atrial fibrillation. Our worry is, though, that people who have symptomatic atrial fibrillation may also have episodes of asymptomatic atrial fibrillation. But if somebody uh, has a cardiomonitor and they do rhythm strips on a regular basis, it's a way to keep very good track of whether or not they're having atrial fibrillation fibrillation. And if they don't seem to be having atrial fibrillation, and it seems safe that they're not having a high burden of atrial fibrillation, then in those patients, it may be uh, best to actually have them off anticoagulation so they don't have the risk of bleeding. And if they're out of atrial fibrillation, then they also don't have uh, the stroke risk either. So uh, as, as much monitoring as we can get done, the better, both for diagnosis in the first place, but also for following people that we know have had atrial fibrillation. Great, thank you. We've had a couple questions about alcohol and stress as triggers. Can you briefly give a, a response to that one? Yeah, so, so yes, 
<laughs> they are. Yeah, it's a problem. Uh, and the other thing I did mention is caffeine. So people will find, and it's not, again, it's not everybody, um, but people will find that caffeine is a trigger because caffeine is uh, basically a, an adrenaline analog in the body. Uh, it increases electrical uh, speed of conduction through the, through the, through the uh, electrical system of the heart. It increases heart rate. Uh, alcohol has a direct effect. There's been studies done uh, to show that alcohol does have a direct effect on the uh, conduction velocities of the electrical system of the heart. So it, again, in people whose trigger is, happens to be set up so that uh, alcohol increases velocity in just the wrong place, then alcohol, even in moderate doses, uh, can participate, uh, can precipitate atrial fibrillation in those people. And of course, stress, the common final pathway of stress is uh, adrenaline. And uh, adrenaline can also in people who happen to have, uh, you know, their trigger just in the wrong place, or have their trigger affected by adrenaline, stress uh, may, may do it as well. So, um, some of those things are treatable and avoidable. Um, stress may or may not be treatable and avoidable. Uh, and if uh, those patients find that, you know, that those situations are there and they, they can't make appropriate adjustments, then the hope is that, um, that medical therapy, antiarrhythmic therapy or ablation therapy might be able to, to change the picture so that they can be uh, more asymptomatic and have less episodes of atrial fibrillation. Great, thank you so much. So we, we're getting close to, to the end. So um, we'll probably wrap up with one last question. We've had quite a few questions here, people you know, with specifics about their history, their experience. Um, and so I think kind of an overarching question that I'm hearing is if somebody has had AFib in the past, um, is it possible for it to just go away? Um, I think, you know, somebody who's had a five hour episode, um, but then two months later, only one 17 second episode or years ago, they had it and they've been on medication. So a lot of different questions like that. Can you kind of speak to, you know, the long-term um, effects? Does, does it go away? Is it possible to have just a few episodes and then have it not be a persistent problem in the future? Yeah, so I, I think that um, it's never cured. I mean, it's not cured by anything. It's not cured by ablation. Uh, it's always kind of in the background to some extent. But as I said earlier, it's absolutely unpredictable. And there are people who have an episode and go 10 years longer and, and don't have another episode. Uh, there are people who you know, have an episode every couple of years uh, and has to be dealt with and treated and gotten rid of and it doesn't come back for another couple of years. Uh, and then there's people who start having atrial fibrillation and it seems to occur kind of on a weekly basis and we have to be much more aggressive. So I would say it never goes away, but I would also say that it's completely unpredictable uh, and some patients do very well, have an episode and, you know, don't have any difficulties for a very, very long time. And that very, very long time may be forever. And there are some people who have episodes at intervals that are more problematic, but are uh, more easily dealt with. And there are some people who have uh, very frequent episodes that become, uh, you know, very bothersome that require much more aggressive therapy. Yeah, I, I think the the big thing about atrial fibrillation is it's uh, is its unpredictability. It's uh, it's hard, and it, and and I understand it's a little bit anxiety provoking, especially in patients who are very symptomatic with it. They feel terrible, and you know, am I going to feel terrible tomorrow or feel terrible in ten years? And it, it's really hard to know, and it's impossible to answer. Um, but the important thing to remember is it's not a life threatening arrhythmia. Uh, you know, we can, we can get it treated. Uh, we can, you know, keep the quality of life where most people want it to be with, uh, with treatment. Uh, and as long as we stay on top of it and use anticoagulation appropriately, uh, 
uh, we can prevent the most serious complication, which is stroke. Thank you so much. Um, any closing remarks, Dr. Watson? Uh, I just want to thank everybody. I mean, it's, uh, I see we have, a, a, I'm counting 110 participants. So that's a lot of people out there. I'm kind of in the dark here, so I can't see anybody but Christy. But uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, if we can help out at all, just uh, just let me know. Thank you, Dr. Watson. And I do want to say to those of you, thank you for submitting all your questions. Um, we, we got to as many as we could. Um, and what we'll do after this presentation is send out some resources for you all. Um, and also, I wanted to, to mention that Dr. Watson serves patients in San Inez Valley, and he's at the Medical Cardiology Outpatient Clinic um, his address is here on the screen, 2040 Viborg, and his phone number is right here on the screen. So again, thank you to all for being here and for your really great, great questions. Thank you, Dr. Watson, for a wonderful presentation. So informative, um, so important um, for the community and, and such a great topic. So thank you. And we will see you. And I do want to mention there's a survey after this. So please do provide any feedback to us. Um, we would really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a great night.